Evening, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Um, welcome to the RSA. Um, I'm Andy Holden, the Chief Executive here. Uh, fantastic to see so many of you here um, in the great room. Just wait for the final guests to come in. Uh, and also, I know the many hundreds we have watching in online as well. You're very welcome to this very special event with tonight's very special uh, guest speaker, the eminent economic and political historian, Lord Skelsky. Uh, Robert, as you all know, is Emeritus Professor of Political Economy at the University of Warwick. And it's there where I first came across Robert and his work uh, many, many, many decades ago when I was a graduate student. Uh, and indeed, my intro to Robert was, as I imagine with many of you too, through his magisterial, which is the right word, uh, three-volume biography of, of Keynes, uh, which has won so many prizes, I can't even read them all out in the time available uh, this evening. Um, Robert was a, became a life peer in 1991, I think, uh, and is a fellow of the British Academy. Now, last week, you'll all have seen the UK hosted an AI safety summit, which resulted in an international declaration to address the risks associated with technology. Of course it did. But that, what that does mean is that there can't have been a more timely moment to welcome uh, Robert here to the RSA to discuss the ideas he sets out in his new publication, The Machine Age, here it is here, uh, in which Robert explores the role of humanity and its long relationship with machines and technology, drawing both from the past and then pulling out some lessons for the future. Rather like his Keynes biography, it too is magisterial uh, in its reach and in its relevance to the issues uh, of today. I'm going to start by hearing from Robert for about 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up to a conversation in the room and indeed online as well. So come prepared uh, with your questions for Robert. We'll get through as many of those as possible, and then we'll try and finish uh, at seven o'clock uh, sharp. For those joining online, you can post your questions. Uh, in the chat there or across social media using the hashtag, hashtag RSA technology. And with that, and without further ado, uh, please join me in welcome to the stage, Robert Skidelsky. I think I'll take this off because I'll get too hot. Well, I'd like to thank the RSA um, for giving me this opportunity to present my new book to Andy, both for his remarks and for agreeing to chair this event, to my publisher, Alan Lane, for, um, who contributed to the cost, and of course, to all of you for coming. The book is an ambitious and almost certainly over-ambitious attempt to understand the human condition at this moment in time through the prism of the relationship, um, of our relationship with machinery. Um, and it's structured around three stories. The relationship of machines to jobs, the relationship of machines to freedom, and the relationship of machines to survival. Of course, in, when I talk about the relationship between humans and machines, I'm using a figure of speech. It's not the machines which prom promise heaven or threaten hell. It's those who turn on the switches. Um, and the danger is that sooner rather than later, they'll lose control of what they've created, like Frankenstein um, and, and his monster. So here are the three stories. The job displacement story is really out of the headlines, and with it, the threat of human redundancy as machines force more and more people into uselessness. Almost half of the workers fear, fear AI will replace them is a typical, typical sort of remark you get. This is from the Times of Saturday, two days ago.
My second story is about how our dependence on technology places immense powers of surveillance and control in the hands of the state, its agencies, and the giant tech platforms. My third story is the extinction story, about how the acceleration of technological power threatens the physical liquidation of our species. And you th may think that's very far-fetched, but in fact, it's become an in increasingly insistent idea, um, uh, both in the scientific community, uh, it's long been, it's long been a, a major idea in science fiction and dystopian fiction. So each story has a vision of heaven and hell. Job displacement promises leisure, but threatens uselessness. Computer technology promises freedom, but threatens despotism. Artificial intelligence promises to prolong life and extinguish it. How to make sense of all this? In 1930, John Maynard Keynes, about whom I've written, um, wrote an essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, which has been a great source of inspiration for me. What sort of story should we tell our grandchildren? Let's start with the most familiar story. What will happen to jobs? Here's what Elon Musk told Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at Bletchley Park last week. Artificial intelligence will elim eliminate the need for all jobs. Jobs will become a hobby, a pastime for a time when consumers had reached the point of bliss, when they no longer needed to work for a living. A wonderful idea. But then Musk was also a signatory to a letter calling for a pause in AI development, so as, a, so as to make and I quote this, today's powerful state of art systems more accurate, more safe, interpretable, transparent, robust, aligned, trustworthy, and loyal. So there's the vision of heaven, and then this awful warning, we've got to create AIs that are trustworthy and loyal. What's, what's that about? And the demand expressed in this letter is that the deployment of machines should take into account our interests as human beings. Is it really such a good idea that no one will need to work? The fear that machines will destroy not only our livelihoods, but the meaning of life, goes all the way back to the Luddites in the early 19th century. It shoots up um, when IBM's deep blue um, beat um, the world chess champion Garry Kasparov in 1997. Suddenly you've got this vision of the power of machines to, do, to, to, to beat, beat the best that the humans can offer. And then uh, it has crescendoed just recently with um, the, the achievements of generative AI in the form of chat GPT. So you, you have, you have this, this crescendo of fear as, as the machines get more powerful, what is it that they're going to do, not just to jobs, but to humans? The fear of what David Ricardo in 1827 called human redundancy has never been far from the surface. Is the machine our friend or is the machine our enemy? Of course it can be both, a friend for some, an enemy for others. It can both, Im both improve our welfare measured by GDP and reduce our sense of well-being as humans, which, much of which is unmeasurable. And the question of friend or enemy takes us outside the workplace. We're talking not about factory robots now, but about networks of computers to whom we are wired up for all our important activities. I'm writing this, or I was writing this, on my computer. Um, for all I know, someone else's computer clicked an alert. Is this a friendly, or un would this be a friendly or unfriendly act? We don't know, but we are network dependent to an extent, of course, we've never been in the past. So the frame of this, the book's second discussion is provided by Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon of 1786. 
a sketch of an ideal prison system in which the prison governor would shine a light on the surrounding prison cells from a central watchtower while himself remaining unseen. This would abolish the need for actual prison guards. In other words, a cost-saving device, um, which obviously in a, Bentham um, would, have, would have appreciated. Um, so Bentham's was, then his ambition was uh, stretched way beyond prisons, and he, 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 he thought it could be applied to schools this uh, watchtower, to, to um, uh, hospitals, and to workplaces. He was a vision of society as an ideal prison. It inspired the one-way television system in George Orwell's 1984, in which, as you know, Big Brother is continually watching you. And technology's role, I argue in my book, is not to create spying systems, these are, these are as old as time, but to perfect them. So my second story can be thought of as the Orwellian creep story. And I've got some personal experience to back this up. I mean, Orwell uh, wrote in 1939, unless you sort of see, unless you experience something, you know, uh, something of the, of the system, this is 1939. You won't, you, 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 you won't be alert to what's going on. I've had some experiences of that kind, and they've influenced what I've written, but that, that's, that's for another time and another, and another event. But what, I, what it, these experiences have um, prompted me to do is to write as follows in, in my book. Bentham's world is coming to pass. Today's digital control systems operate not through watchtowers, but through computers with electronic tracking devices and voice and facial recognition systems. So we enter Bentham's world, prisons, voluntarily, oblivious to its snares, but once inside, it's increasingly difficult to escape. It's often argued that there's a trade-off between privacy and security, and in a world of increasing menace, it's privacy that has to yield. One, sees this argument the whole time, especially in the Times. Um, uh, <clears throat> but, but Bentham's vision of the ideal prison took shape before military intelligence picked it up and robots made it possible. It's part of the quest for the perfect society. It goes all the way back to Plato, and it really took off in the 18th century. So it's an ideal. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a question of keeping sort of uh, uh, rebellious humans in check, so to speak. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an ideal of a, of a perfect society in which you wouldn't, need, you wouldn't need brute force any longer because everyone would do what they wanted, they would be incapable of having thoughts other than those that Big Brother wanted them to have. So we must surely alert our grandchildren to the potential malignity of the technology they will otherwise take for granted. My book's third thread is about physical extinction. If you Google books, engram, um, uh, viewer, you will see the increasing use of words and phrases like extinction and existential risk, they've really shot up in the last 20 years, denoting a growing perception of looming catastrophe, which, as I indicated, is not just now uh, the, the, the province of science fiction and dystopian fiction. It's been taken over by many, many leading scientists. Um, and they, they, there's the, the, doomsday, the doomsday clock, published by the Bulletin of, 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 of Atomic Physicists or a Physicist, which shows that we're drawing steadily closer to what they call countdown. In the pre-modern period, the existential challenges which humans had to face were mainly caused by natural catastrophes. Um, these were usually attributed to disobedience to God, the Bible prophesies an apocalypse as God's punishment for mankind's sinning. 
The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, and they that dwell therein are burnt. Such natural disasters still happen, of course. But the ones we now worry about are anthropogenic disasters caused by our own feckless behavior. The historian Misha Glenny has talked of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, nuclear proliferation, global warming, pandemics, and what he calls network dependency. Now, the supreme paradox at the heart of current responses to these kind of prognostications is that while awareness of the extinctive possibilities of technology grows, is, did this cause all those bangs? Sorry. Um, let me just start that sentence again. I mean, because the paradox seems to me important. While awareness um, uh, of, of the extinctive possibilities of technology has been growing, no one is prepared to give up its redemptive promise. And that is a, 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 a very odd situation. Uh, for example, I, I give you an, an example there. Max Clifford, head of the UK government's Advanced Research and Invention Agency claims that AI will be able to kill many people in the next few years, but it also has immense potential for good. If it goes right, you can imagine AI curing diseases, making the, economic, the economy productive, helping us to get to a carbon neutral economy. So all these good things are sort of on one side, but then it can kill millions of people. So, um, uh, that's where the article ends, as most of these things do. Um, <laughs> what drives the relentless quest for more and more powerful computers, irrespective of their destructive possibilities? Two things, I suggest. The first is the Daedalus complex of scientists and technicians. From the 18th century onwards, scientists started thinking of themselves as social engineers, and economists have been in the forefront of the quest for social perfection uh, through the ideal equilibrium of market prices. I mean, that ideal economic system was there from the beginning of classical economics. And I think Friedrich Hayek, who otherwise I sort of re you know, regard as not a, a not, not, not a very positive force in the development of modern economics, did say something very important. Um, and, and when he warned against, and I quote, the uncritical transfer to the problems of society of the habits of thought of the natural scientist and engineer. These habits of thought continue to shape mainstream's view of technology and its possibilities. Medicine is a good example of why it's so difficult to turn off the switch. AI may kill millions, but it may save even more millions, and billions yet to come, according to the transhumanists. So you can see, you can see the dilemma always there. But the second reason um, to doubt that an off switch, even a pause, will ever be activated is because AI research is now thoroughly weaponized. Technology has made possible war in the air, under the sea, and, and, and it will enable war in space. Um, pick up an issue on digital NATO, published by our own parliament's scientific all-parliamentary group, and you will read in the usual barbarous language of such publications that the growing prevalence of hybrid threats is mandating the need for NATO to, its, to ensure its warfare development ag agenda, VDA, um, is digitally enabled, thus delivering an integrated and interoperable multi-domain operations defense capability. You see, so it goes on like this. I mean, total rubbish, this sort of language. Um, vague and, and, and sort of lacking precision and indeed lacking um, any, 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 any uh, opaqueness, uh, fully opaque. And then it goes on, you see. 
Digital innovation is the golden thread that cr cuts across all aspects of NATO's warfare development agenda. Our commitment to harnessing cutting-edge technologies ensures that our alliance is always one step ahead. One step ahead of whom? China, of course. China is where we have to be, the country we have to be one step ahead of. And what does Beijing say about this? Well, they have to be one step ahead too. And so the, the, the idea of, of, of uh, international cooperation to reduce the damaging effects of AI development sort of disappears into, into a myopic mist. It, that, it, you don't see how it's going to happen. Weaponization of AI development prevents any international agreement to control it. Um, so, what do we finally tell our grandchildren? It would be wonderful to say, disaster isn't inevitable. We can and must think our way through and out of it. I wouldn't deny for a moment, how can I, that ideas help shape events. Um, but to be effective, ideas, both good and bad, also need the support of events. We cannot change our fate by thought alone. We need the support of periodic and extremely painful experiences. And this has been the historical method of progress. As I put it in my book, if we are to reconcile our belief in progress with the evidence of continuous human wickedness, we have to believe in something like the redem redemptive power of evil. It's a difficult idea, but what it does entail is a religious approach to life and fate, not an abandonment of science, but an understanding of its limits. If religion is lame without science, science is blind without religion. These words of Albert Einstein sum up what we have to transcend, words of the greatest scientist of the 20th century. He understood this. Look at it this way. Evil events, the First World War, the hyperinflation, the Great Depression, brought the Nazis to power. But it was the evils of Nazism which created the conditions for the pacification and continued prosperity of Europe and, of course, the state of Israel as well. How do we make sense of this appalling sequence of good and evil, except in a religious frame? I don't know how to. Could a milder method have achieved the same result? I doubt it. Even Keynes thought it would need a big war to validate his theory. This he wrote in 1938. I doubt if any government will have the confidence to apply my theories outside a great war. And so there again, you, you have this, um, you have this um, um, dialectic. A contemporary social scientist, Albert Hirschman, has transformed the idea of the biblical storm into um, that of um, the optimal crisis, um, uh, a crisis deep enough to provoke a change in awareness, but not so deep that it wipes us out. And we, and we can translate it back into religious language. It's through bringing about extreme events that the devil does God's work. And you know, as I've written the book and got to the present day, I, I, I find it harder and harder to escape from that conclusion, if I am to preserve any sense of optimism about the future. So my three stories do um, end with a qualified optimism, with the last two sentences of my book reading, in Christian theodicy, apocalypse means revelation and is a prelude to the second coming, for such things must come to pass, but the end shall not be yet. Thank you. Robert, come take a seat. And thank you for that um, riveting laying out um, of, a, of a deep and rich book. 
And um, do uh, prepare your questions. We'll come to those in just a second. But just while you're thinking of them, perhaps, Robert, I can um, probe one or two of the issues that you explore. Um, Could I get a pen? I, I left my, um, if anyone can help me with that, I left it in, in, in the other room. Thanks. It's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, can I start on technology and history? Because, as you know, um, as well or better than anyone, actually, we have had these concerns about technology as a, as a job killer through each and every one of the industrial revolutions that we've been through, 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And I wondered, here in the 21st century, as we stand at the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution, what's different? Mm. Those weren't job killers. Will this time, will AI be different? What's different about AI this time, do you think? Well, <laughs> it's a very good, very good point, and it's, 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 it's a point often made by the optimist. I think it's just that the reach of modern technology into the job market is much wider than it was before. It was mainly manual jobs that um, were, 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 were obliterated. I mean, in the case of the Luddites, um, okay, um, you had um, the, the, the handloom weavers, and there were three or 400,000 of them. Five, maybe 500,000, they were all gone by, by, um, by you know, 20 or 30 years after, by the 1840s, 1850s. First of all, their wages were depressed, then they had to leave the trade. And you've had that time and time again. But they've always been replaced by other jobs. But what, what I think, um, and, and, and gradually, um, the, you know, the manual working class shrunk and the middle class, office working class, expanded. And so you had a lot of that going on, but now it's the reach of um, um, uh, uh, computers, it, it's the automation of office work that is regarded as the main threat. And, 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 and people like Martin Ford say there just won't be enough replacement jobs. Now, of course, creative, so the idea then would be um, lovely, lovely, lovely jobs at the top for a few and lousy jobs for everyone else as everyone got decanted into sort of less satisfying jobs. But now the creative jobs at the top um, uh, are being challenged by chat GPT. So you have another, you know, you can write, they can, they can, they can produce work just as good as any, any, any creative artist, the, the argument goes. So there'll be nothing left to do, except maybe some jobs requiring manual dexterity, because, you know, <coughs> they, they, Robots can't pour drinks well and things like that. But, you know, broadly speaking, the, the, the pessimists argue that contrary to what happened in the past, you now have such a much wider reach um, and depth of, of, um, of automation that needs to be contrasted to mechanization, which was the old word for it, that you don't have any, 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 any real jobs left, except jobs people do as hobbies. That seems to be the answer. And that's also, that's also I mean, uh, another, another optimistic view is, look, you, you, you attack technology, but think of the huge improvements in living standards that it's made possible over the last 150, 200 years. I mean, that's machinery. Um, I mean, because the very, the very, um, the, the, the very, the result, the consequences of cheapening the cost of making things has, of course, Allowed, allowed people to buy many more, more things and, and, and has produced continuous economic growth. So, where do you, where you, where do you draw the balance? Very good. So, um, you mentioned there, um, just on the same theme of jobs killing, I wondered what you made of um, the Elon Musk quote that you, you mentioned in your opening address that, that there will be a job for any of us in future. You know, in the long run, we'll all be dead, but the medium term, we'll also be unemployed. Um, do you think that was useful alerting us to the risk or scaremongering? Well, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was typical of Musk. I mean, you know, saying something so sharply that people have to... I mean, it goes viral in, in the current phrase. Any, any Musk 
remark goes viral, and it's intended to go viral. But I, I, would, I would give him the credit for saying, OK, let's think, let, let's think through about things. I don't think he's, you know, uh, all his thoughts cohere, but they're, they're certainly startling. And all he's saying is actually what um, much more serious um, um, uh, 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 um, uh, economists and, 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 and industrial students of industry have been saying, like Martin Ford, that there will be replacement jobs, but there won't be enough replacement jobs to take care of the people who are made redundant. And, and they won't be as good, the replacement jobs. They will be of an inferior quality to the jobs being given up, as opposed in the past to them on the whole being of superior quality, uh, requiring more skills. And what, and, and then, you, then you have, I mean, to just follow up your question, you, you, you set up a scenario in which there is a continuous race going on between skills and jobs. We've got to upskill, upskill, upskill in order to get, you know, some chance uh, of, 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 of keeping up with the machines, racing with the machines. But to me, that's a horrible idea. I mean, basically, as a, as, as a human prospect, as, as the human prospect. But that seems to be the way they would, um, a lot of the optimists would deal with it. And then I think also that there's deep ambiguity about what people mean by skilling, upskilling versus downskilling. Obviously, there's been a whole lot of upskilling in the last 150 years, but a huge amount of downskilling. We, we often forget about this. People know how to make fewer and fewer things. They lose a lot of skills. Now, OK, you have to draw up a balance, but the, the, the cliche, oh, what we've got to do is upskilling, therefore we've got to train, we've got to train, retrain, and so on, uh, leaves me um, a bit sceptical, to put it mildly. And last question from me, then we'll go um, to the audience. You mentioned there the race between machines and humans. You also mentioned in your address Robert, the, the arms race that's going on globally, nationally, between nation states in getting one step ahead technologically. I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. I mean, um, is this, I mean, some would say an arms race is what competition is, and that will drive us to a better place, ultimately, uh, the outer edge of the technological frontier. But of course, we know to our cost that not all arms races are positive. Um, and if they aren't positive, I mean, is there a case for some device, some global governance device that could secure some de-escalation in that arms race? You know, as the, as the biographer of Keynes, you know, architect of Bretton Woods, do we need a Bretton Woods for technology to, to break free of this arms race? Yeah, and, 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 and the Bretton Woods technology came after the death of 20 or 30 million people in a global war. I mean, yeah, of course, after, after, after some terrible man-made, human-made catastrophes happened, people do start getting alert to, um, to uh, the dangers of, of the course they're embarked on. It's an interesting idea, though. I mean, arms competition... Of course, when the economists talked of competition... Um, and, 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 and the, the, the douceur of... They didn't think of it as arms competition. They thought of it as an alternative to arms competition. I mean, you, the, the competition in the, of the market was the innocent form and the utterly benevolent form of competition, which they accepted as a sort of, you know, part of the human spirit, um, because it didn't involve any deaths. There were no losers. Now, arms competition... Um, unless you're very, very optimistic, um, it leads to wars sooner or later. I mean, uh, um, you, you gradually get these build-up of these arms all around the world, um, and at some point, people start wanting to use them. I agree there's an argument against this, and that we've had nuclear weapons for ever since the 1940s, and they haven't been used since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
uh, but there are a lot more of them, a lot more countries have them, and they can be used also in many more intermediate capacities than they, they, than they could. You know, it's no longer wiping out a whole big town. You can sort of have small nuclear weapons, and then you get an escalation. So I'm, 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 I'm not sure about this. Now, and of course you're absolutely right, what we need is America, China, India, Brazil, Russia, all the countries with nuclear weapons, um, and Pakistan would be included there, to sit down together and, and, and agree on some rules of the game. And also, um, all the countries capable, capable of destroying the world to agree not to do it and how not to do it. And that would be an ethical, uh, ethical determination. But ethics and geopolitics are in terrific conflict. The same people who talk about the ethical imperative also talk about the geopolitical imperative in the same breath. We can only have world agreement if China's regime changes completely. Can we do that peacefully? Who's going to do it? So I think there's a huge contradiction at the heart of this, ethics versus geopolitics. And I, I fear that geopolitics has been gaining ground. Ever since the early 90s, when you know, communism collapsed, and suddenly we had what was called the Fukuyama moment, you know, everything would be wonderful. Um, and then gradually the disillusionment that's been growing, and now the full return to a geopolitical view of the world, not, a, not entirely our fault by any means, but as a fact, makes, makes, makes your, your idea a bit utopian. <laughs> Let's go to the floor on that. Um, and we'll take a couple this side. We'll take them maybe blocks of three because there's plenty of questions. Just wait for the microphone. We'll start on this side. Um, these two gentlemen here, and then we'll, we'll swap over. And I'm a bit deaf, so you may have to Rick tell me what... Speak up and use the microphone if that's OK. Um, Robert, I'm, I'm clutching your book rather like a, a raft in a torrent of uncertainty and disorder and turmoil, indeed now descending into barbarism in the modern world. So we're not in an age of enlightenment at all. My, my quest, so that's my hope from your book, but my question is rather more specific and detailed one. You keep, both of you talk about, and the book talks about jobs, where the jobs come from. Most people work for a living. Some people live for work, and some people work for a living so that they can do some other work of a nicer kind. That, that's, so the question really is not so much the jobs, but the, the question is how do resources get to the people so that they can enjoy life, do their other work for nothing, voluntary, and um, proceed as human beings in a vastly changing world. So what does your book say, or what do you say, about the ideas for getting resources to people other than through paid work? In other words, there's the universal income being tried, there's the universal capitalism, which hasn't really yet been tried anywhere near in this country, although it's quite advanced in America. Aren't those the, aren't those the, the real issues that have to be addressed as the AI machine rolls forward in ways which, frankly, no one's got the slightest clue again where, where, they, where they're going to lead. Very good. Thank well, you. Yeah. Do you want to take this so, one? Yeah, or? I'll take that because yeah. um, it's, it's, got, it's got two interesting parts. I mean, how do you get the resources to the people? Well, one, one way of getting resources to the people, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking, well, it applies to, actually applies to both cases, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a question of distribution, isn't it? I mean, if you have a very unequal society um, and growing inequality, um, then the resources created by technology go increasingly to a very small minority of people. And that has been, I mean, that's been the argument of Piketty. And it's also been the argument, I mean, there's been, there's been a lot of empirical work on this, saying that inequality has, on the whole, been growing since the 1990s um, in, in, in America and in the UK. So getting resources to the people isn't just a matter of economic growth or the growth of productivity. Of course, that's a part of it. But it's also actually redistributing um, the fruits of, of technology. 
in in the in the nineteen sixties and seventies, uh, when you when you when when you had, on the whole, you in the UK, I'm thinking of mainly, you got good 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 growth of productivity. You had a reasonable rate of growth. Of course, we thought we were slower than anyone else, but it was two two three percent. But we also had very strong trade unions, and so there was this balance um, between employers and unions, which proved to be compatible with an equalization or compression of incomes. That has disappeared now. So that's the first answer to your question. Um, how, um, you, you, you have to make sure that um, the, the dividend from growth goes, is more widely distributed. Now, one way of doing that is through universal basic income. And um, I talk a bit about it in this book, but, but I mean, I don't talk very much about it because I, I, I deal with it in some other things I've written and, and I go into it. I, I, I'm not, not against universal basic income. I'm a bit worried if, it is, if, it, if, it, if it's... If, if, if it's the way to deal with the Elon Musk problem of no one having to work, because I'm a bit worried about a whole population living on, on universal basic income. I mean, I mean, it worries me. I mean, I think universal basic income increases the choice people have, and that's very important. So getting the resources to the people is a question of distribution as much as anything else. One word, one, one sentence answer to your question. And the uh, gentleman just next door. Um, thank you. A fascinating talk, and I'm looking forward to reading your book. Can I ask about another vector in this? We've talked a lot about the threat to income, the threat to, to stability in terms of economic entities. It's taken a rather institutional view. I have a feeling that there's another existential threat which is moving a lot faster and that's the, dis the distribution of misinformation, which we know has been hugely facilitated by the networks. We can see unspooling at an enormous rate. If I was to be a little, a little bit perhaps overstated, I'd say that is actually simply going to make the jobs question irrelevant because we'll live in a world in which groups, communities are so fragmented that they'll simply be struggling for their own existence. And I wonder if that's something that you have thoughts on Interestingly, the dual role of Elon Musk in this as a sage on the economic side, as somebody who is now hugely benefiting from the unspooling of a solid basis of information and education in the world, which his, his network is actually a primary factor at the moment in destroying. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can do that or we can do another should we, one. Should we collect three and then come back to you, Robert? That's okay. Thank you. Uh, Sir. Yes. I'm not sure it is on. Here we go. Try this one. This one. Thank you. So I like to think of the contrast between artificial intelligence and human stupidity. <laughs> and my concern is that human stupidity will drive things more than artificial intelligence. So if you, if you look at many sort of accidents, chemical accidents, industrial accidents, nuclear accidents or whatever, it's often failures in management systems or what humans do that actually drives it. So we've got human stupidity and unfortunately technology seems to amplify that. So if we look at social media, look at the internet, it, there's a lot of good that comes out of it, but a lot of sort of foolishness and even at the highest levels, the best and the brightest, if you look at what's being discussed via WhatsApp during the COVID situation by the government, you can see that this is sort of a foolishness. So you've got this stupidity, but you've also got malevolence as well. And malevolence is a big concern. Okay, so we can regulate the technology companies, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we control the actions of governments. So we can have bad actors as governments, and we can have bad actors who are also non-governmental. So if you put stupidity and foolishness and malevolence together, that creates a real problem in terms of the potential for good or evil coming from the technology. So my question is this. You talk about humanity in a machine age, and the implication is that the machine age is changing humanity. But I wonder, is the problem that humanity actually hasn't been changed by the machine age, that we continue to do those stupid, foolish, and malevolent things that we've done for ages? Thank you. Yeah, but we have uh, just we have more power to do them. That's, I'll answer that question in a second. That was my off-the-cuff off yes, yes, remark. Hello. Um, Is that working? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You've slightly blown my mind. 
Um, I was really fascinated by what you talked about towards the end, about the relationship between religion and this rise in AI. It really struck me that perhaps we've spent too much time thinking about the capacity of the machine and not thinking about the capacity of humanity. And so I'm wondering, is the rise in this AI in part a result of a crisis in spirituality? And will it really take a catastrophe for us to remember our humanity? Three great questions. Robert. Yeah. Um, the answer to the first question about information asymmetry is yes, I do, do, do deal with that. There's a whole chapter on it uh, in my book, and it's called Liberation Versus Entrapment. I mean, the, the, the promise of, um, of information technology was that it would free us, free ordinary people from the control of authorities of one kind or another, originally the church, then of course any despotic authority. In other words, it would be democratic. Everyone would have access to um, uh, information without gatekeepers along the way telling them what information is suitable for them to have. It hasn't worked out that way, I don't think. Of course it has up to a point, but in fact we have we do have gatekeepers. They're very powerful gatekeepers. They're not exactly the same gatekeepers we had before, or well, they're under different names. I mean, one, one set of gatekeepers are the, the tech giants who, who have a monopoly um, of, of um, access to um, goods and services, and the other is the state, which, and they, they feed off each other. Um, and they have information. I mean, they, they sort of control vast, between them, vast quantities of data. The big data, which we're always told about, is actually in the control of very, very few people. And what's more, most of us don't understand the, the, the processes by which our lives are mined um, and made use of by people who want either to um, keep us under some sort of control or sell us things. We don't understand that process. We see convenience. I mean, increasingly, a lot of people see inconvenience in being online the whole time. I mean, I was very interested in reading just an article today by Edward Luce in The Times about his aunt and the horrors of trying to get services for her in her old age online and, and, and the nightmare of bureaucracy and things of that kind. I mean, it's all, it's all there, but most people don't attach yet, yet very much importance to it. But asymmetry of information is, 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 is a crucial point. How do you get over it? I don't know. The processes have to become um, sufficiently transparent. But then, of course, when, uh, as soon as you talk about transpa transparency, becomes a word. It's in every single document I read. We must make all this transparent. In fact, it's bloody untransparent, and it's going to be very untransparent for most people most of the time. The processes are inherently uh, opaque. We know that the people who develop and invent AIs themselves don't understand how it works. So that's, that's the point one. Um, human stupidity. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, I would say human stupidity is, is, is a constant uh, factor. But the, 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 the promise always was, if you read the 18th century uh, Enlightenment philosophers, they understood human, that human stupidity was there, was a huge factor, but they thought it was due to ignorance, you see, that humanity being kept in ignorance by the church, particularly. And once you lifted that, so incubus, ignorance would vanish. It would vanish. People would be, have access to all the information that they needed to lead, lead sensible life, and, and therefore wickedness would disappear because stupidity, uh, wickedness was the result of stupidity. It wasn't the result of some original sin, as, as the church is taught. It was the result of stupidity. Therefore, get rid of ignorance, and you'll, you know, you, 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 you'll transform the human race. I mean, it's amazing to read what they were writing, people like Condorcet in the 18th century, about the 
redemptive power of statistics. If only, you, if only you could sort of develop a statistical picture of the universe, there would be no more wars, no more crime, no more folly, nothing. So um, what worries me is um, now, um, I think one implication of what you said is perfectly correct. Without AI, we've done very, very badly as well. And it, it, we don't need further AI um, to sort of um, 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 destroy us. Existing, existing capacity of computers um, is enough to inflict damage. When we're in control of them, we don't need to postulate a period when computers escape our control. Even computers within our control can do a lot of damage because you have to look at the ethics of the controllers and what it is that they want, what their goals are, and then the distribution of power between the, 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 the controllers themselves. So that's an answer I can't. I mean, I can't go, and, and yes, I mean, I agree with you. I agree with the third comment. Um, uh, I, I, I think that it's, it's easy. I mean, the, the point about religion, I think, or the religious in, in input, I know this may be um, into, into our history, is somehow it's, it's limited the power of wickedness. I mean, I know it's, it's it, you know, people will, will obviously um, query this and think of the terrible wars of religion, the terrible massacres that have been done in the name of religion and all that. But I still think on the whole, it's made us less wicked in our behavior than we would have been without it. And I think what its effect has been is to restrain the godlike aspirations of scientists and engineers. I mean, it's sort of denied that they are gods. And I think many of them have thought of themselves as gods, as, as, as inheriting the power of the priests. There's endless, endless quotations you can give um, of exactly that presumption. And that's a very dangerous presumption. Because the word of God is still a test against which, you, you, a measure against which you can judge, some human, judge human pretension. And we haven't got any measure like that coming out of science. Uh, we've got a huge number of questions, both pre-submitted and indeed online. So I'm going to pick off one of those before I go back to the audience. Um, and a number here, um, Robert, uh, around education on what impact AI and technology might have in reshaping education and learning for good or need for ill? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, I touched on it in an earlier answer when I um, um, queried the, 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 the debate about skilling uh, and whether we're, we, we, whether we're engaged in upskilling or downskilling. Um, and, and I think that's uh, something to be resolved. I, 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 I don't really believe in education primarily. I'm, I'm a humanist on, 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 on educational matters, and I think um, that, um, um, you, you know, uni school and universities to teach you um, about, about life uh, and, and not just to skill you uh, in order to prepare you for a job. I mean, that goes back to the 19th century, the debate, the utilitarian view of education versus the humanistic view. On that view, I come out on the humanistic side. But of course, it's not extreme. Of course, you've got to be prepared to, you know, for a job as well. But, you know, um, so it's, this isn't a binary, it's a binary uh, question. But I think one of, the th one of the things that's caused alarm to university teachers n now is not um, is, is, is another form of loss of skilling that's going on, which is through chat GPT. I mean, the fact that they can produce mediocre work, which is just as good as you know, most students do most of the time. In, 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 other words, in other words, what's happening here is that you're getting an incentive either to um, produce less good work than you could, because it's, too, it's very easy to get it off this new form of plagiarism. Or um, it, it is um, 
uh, uh, um, either, yeah, either incentive to produce less good work, or it sort of gives you a false measure of good work. I mean, and, and at any rate, what's gone is the unique um, individual contribution to the tasks you're doing. I mean, university teachers are, of course, exceptionally sensitive to this. They can't tell whether an essay question has been copied from somewhere or, or, is, or is the original work of the student. So that's the form in which some of this is taken. But the basic idea behind the question is, do we think that we are in training people for the job market now in the process of upskilling or downskilling? I'm going to take um, the gentleman here, I think, has got the mic, so we best let him speak. Um, sir, yeah. Um, Robert, I was very pleased that you mentioned uh, uh, Gary Kasparov's defeat uh, by Deep Blue in 1997, because that was the year when I managed to draw a game against Kasparov. <laughs> but the point, the point, the reason I think that's important is that the whole history of AI is intertwined with the arms race, on the one hand, between the Soviet Union and the United States, the West, but also the game of chess, uh, because the early computers were designed to create perfect chess games in order to, uh, to win wars, um, because chess is a war game. And, uh, of course, we know the Americans won that race uh, decisively by the 1980s. Uh, they were streets ahead of, of the Soviet Union in, in computer technology. Um, but, uh, and, uh, but what I think we've seen since then is a terrible attempt at revenge by the Russians, uh, that Putin, uh, armed with uh, more modern uh, computer technology, uh, has now launched um, a terrible war in Ukraine. And funnily enough, it was Kasparov uh, who predicted this and uh, has been one of his most ferocious critics. I just wondered what you thought about all that. Well, I mean, I, I, I think a lot about it, and, I, and, I, and I'm very sympathetic to what, what you've just said. I mean, I think we must never forget that we wouldn't have had the technology we now have had it not been for the Cold War. And throughout history, war and war preparations have been a major driver of technological innovation. It's not, I mean, you know, we tend to take the view that it's capitalism that has been the driver. And capitalism, of course, capitalist competition has, has of course, be, has been important. But government procurement policies and the huge sums of money that were invested in the arms race in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and have gone on now, because we've, we've, you know, geopolitics has revived as, as, as an important concern, um, um, uh, can't, can't be, can't be uh, ignored. And, and, and of course, also the, the connection between war and chess. I mean, these, you know, you, you, you eventually start asking the question, where are the adults in the room? I mean, you know, you play these games of chess, you get the nerds, and then they think, oh, well, this is, you, know, you can apply this to the actual life. And so the whole of life becomes a game, and then it's a question of who, who's technically best. And it's like the game of Go. I don't know whether anyone has yet beaten the human Go. Pro probably, probably a machine has. But there's something infantile also. There's, there's a re regression to infantilism going on, although we think we're becoming more and more sophisticated. It's AlphaGo beat Lisa Dole about five years ago now, eight years ago. I'm going to take one question down the front here, and one more here, and then I'll have to wrap up. And apologies, but we're into Thank you very extra much time. for your presentation. I look forward to reading the book. Within democratic societies and in some authoritarian societies as well, one response to perceived technological threats has been regulation. And regulation is a complex process. You know, we're pretty good at regulating the standards for constructing bridges because there's a relatively limited number of ways in which they can fail, and so we can design them and test them. But I've been looking at the regulation of industrial chemicals, and over 
my career. And, and, and what I see is that as the years go by, the scientists recognize that actually there are a lot of risks that they weren't even aware of in the first place that they have come to have to acknowledge. And even that acknowledgement is probably still incomplete. So if we're trying, going to try and regulate AI, do we even know what we going would need to test the systems for and how on earth could they be tested? Very good. Yeah. Do you want to collect one more, Robert, and then we'll um, okay. the two together, just behind you. Thank you. Hello there, Robert. I, I wanted to sort of meld religion and economics together, see whether we actually need to think fundamentally differently about some of the major structural things that shape our world today. So if, if you look at AI, AI is not only powerful in and of itself, but AI is being deployed to develop almost every other inner source of innovation, so whether it's new materials, whether it's new medicines, whether it's new um, weapons systems, AI is being deployed in all of those areas. And the people who are looking at this are saying, what we're on is an exponential curve of more and more powerful technology in almost every field. Yet, as, as you've indicated, a lot of the ways that we develop technology is through competition. And some of this technology is getting existentially dangerous. So we've got people worried about AI going rogue, that if we develop it beyond a certain capability, would it take over and start doing its own things? Now, we, a, a significant number of AI people are worried about that themselves. But we have a competitive dynamic in our capitalist system where OpenAI have launched that, Microsoft have backed it, Google have gone, holy shit, they're going to take our market, so we need to put our foot down on the accelerator and develop it faster than them. Amazon are doing the same thing, uh, so is Facebook now, the Chinese are doing it. So we, we have this kind of multipolar trap phenomena where we're, there's a kind of race to the bottom to develop the very thing that could be existentially catastrophic for us. And we take that into the war situation of weaponry as well. So pulling this together, it feels like we're rough, rapidly entering a domain where we will increasingly have the power of gods. But we need to have the wisdom of gods to know how to use that power. Do we need to rethink competition and collaboration? Because it feels that this competition dynamic is creating this race to the bottom and accelerating the risks of our own self-destruction. Do we need to rethink how we balance competition and collaboration? Yeah, I, I think just very quickly, of course, you're right. Uh, I, 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 um, I've, uh, all I'd say is that we normally talk about two sources of competitive dynamic. Uh, sorry, I'll ask to take the, the second question uh, first. Two sources of competitive. One is capitalism. The other, and, and that on the whole is the left wing view of things. Um, but um, what we don't um, take into account is state competition. And state, states are a crucial source of procurement. I doubt if we would have had anything like the technology we now have had it not been for nation states in a competitive... And, and in fact, we know the answer to this to some extent um, when we think of parts of the world which have not been dominated by competition between states. And I'm thinking of China. And uh, when you ask the question, which is uh, one, I just I have a whole chapter on this in, in my book. Why, did, why China, why Britain and not China? Or why Europe and not China? You get very interesting uh, answers to that. Chinese were not in a competitive nation state uh, situation. I mean, they regarded themselves as self-sufficient and, you know, everyone else had to pay tribute to them, but they didn't go out con wanting to conquer territory. Anyway, that's the side of the point. So I agree with that. You've got two sources of competition and states are a very important one. Now, I, I, and your, your, your question is, is I mean, I'm not sure I got it right and I don't want to answer the wrong question. But um, um, so just... Just, uh, could, could, could we have a moment when you could just... Uh, uh, rip if we're going to test the technology, risks, um, 
what are the risks to test for? How comprehensive is our knowledge of the risks for which me white want yeah. to test? Well, and how on earth would we test them? Right. Okay. So here, here, here we get here we get to the Hayek point about the habits of mind of the engineer being applied to society. The way we test our social engineering is we set up and try to create societies, and then they self-destruct. So the test. The test is not a bridge falling down, it's society collapsing. And, and, then, and, and that's why um, I'm driven to the idea that, that, that we, we, need, we, 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 we li progress through apocalypses, which are the testing of many of the ideas of social, um, you know, social progress, if you like. Um, and I don't see a way out of that. I mean, because I, I, I can think, I can sit down with people, and we could all sit down and say, look, we're all adults. These are the sort of regulations we should have. <coughs> now, we have some Chinese and Indians and Ukrainians and everyone else in the room. We can all agree on this, and we don't get it. The answer, actually, is we don't all agree on it. And, um, and, and, and this is a huge uh, issue. We, 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 we have a an ethical system which is riven by what, what's called value relativism. We don't, we have a very thin set of ethics on which we can all agree, very, very, very thin. Mm. And we might, we, might, um, uh, we might reach agreement with that, but that won't stop the development of destructive forms of artificial intelligence. We're going to have to wrap up, but I can't help, I can't resist asking you for one, one more question, Robert. In fact, it's a, for a forecast, in fact. You started off with uh, Keynes' famous 1930 book, Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren, which predicted we'd all be working three-hour days now, and we're not. Um, when will Keynes be right? Will he ever be right? When can we all look forward to that 15-hour week? Robert. Well... We've got so many forces at work in the world to keep resources scarce, sufficiently scarce, to um, force everyone to work. I mean, Keynes was looking forward, he, he was, you know, looking forward to a time when resources would become so abundant because technology would have created them that no one would have to work very hard. But we've found wonderful ways of keeping resources scarce. One is population growth. He didn't anticipate anything like the growth of population that we've had. Secondly, um, uh, wars. He said absence of wars. Wars are a wonderful way of, of, of recreating scarcity and therefore recreating economics. Because as we all know, or some, I mean, economists among us will know, Lionel Robbins' famous decision, uh, uh, definition of economics as the study um, as the science which studies choice between scarce resources. I mean, that's, I haven't got it quite right, but the element of scarcity. Without scarcity, there's no economics. Therefore, we have to, as humans, have to constantly be recreating scarcity in order to justify our existence. And that all, that all comes out of the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? And God's curse. And what a way to end. Um, <laughs> listen, um, what a fantastic discussion that uh, has been. Thank you, everyone in the room and the many, many online uh, for joining us, in particular for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to more of them. There literally was dozens and dozens uh, and dozens. For those in the room... Uh, you can purchase a copy of Robert's book outside. Uh, he'll even sign it for you, I think. Yeah, and, um, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll happily, if anyone want, is so moved to buy one, I will sign it. Um, there's also little, little summaries, which are also a few of them there as well. For those not in the room, but online, um, we'll stick a link in the chat so you can purchase it uh, yourselves at your leisure. For RSA Fellows... If you've been inspired by tonight's discussion, I'm sure you have been, 
uh, it will uh, continue online using our digital platform, which is called uh, Circle. But with that, and having already gone into overtime, please join me uh, in thanking for a fantastic discussion and presentation, Robert Skidelsky. Thank you.